Okay. Welcome to the Explosive Strength Podcast with Jared Pitney. On today's episode, I have Michael Fahey with me. Michael is the director and producer of the West Side Film movie that's coming out. Um, if you've not already got your West Side Film pre-order done, uh, please order your West Side Film at uh, iTunes. And yep. so um, we're just going to go ahead and jump into this uh, with uh, Michael and and see where we go. I don't really have a script or a plan. Uh, basically, we're just going to talk to him about the film. So, Michael, right. welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And so, um, yeah, Michael, you uh, you came down to interview me last year, right? Yeah, I uh, I interviewed you for some bonus features. Um, I had actually heard about you through Louie. Okay, so that's how you found out about the expl explosive mechanics? Yeah. Um, I had a friend who was in the Atlanta area looking for a gym, mm -hmm. and uh, Louie gave me your name, and I think somebody else's, uh, another gym, but he uh, he said, you, you know, you need to check out that explosive mechanics place. And he said, you know, they've got some people who can who can really run and jump. Mm -hmm. And so that led me to checking out your stuff, and I found, uh, is it Colton? And, yeah, Colton, uh, Kyle may have been up there, and the, the, the three kids. Yeah, I, I just saw a bunch of kids who all lifted bigger weights than me, and could jump really well and could squat really well uh, and none of them looked like they could do much of anything. Yeah, and I think we just had our last week we had our 13th high schooler box squat over 500. That's 13 500, not including the three at 600. Yeah, that's that's insane. I just I just squatted 600 for the first time ever yeah. uh, last week and it was in briefs, so I had a little bit of gear and but uh, and people don't realize they say it's a box squat. Well, for my athletes, we're not going to powerlifting competitions. You, exactly. You, you know, so I don't care if it's a box. But the but I don't think they realize that the box is twelve inches. Mm -hmm. We got a twelve inch box, which is real low. Then our, we got a six inch foam pad, but the foam pad sinks almost to the top of that box. Mm -hmm. And to be able to get off of a twelve inch box is pretty tough. So you may have some haters out there and stuff, but. The only thing I care about is the kids at the gym that are getting better. If I keep the box height consistent with them, we got some measurables. Yeah. And so um, let's get into how did, let's talk about West Side. How did you get involved with West Side? You know, like West Side, for those of you that don't know, it's the strongest gym in the world. Yeah. You know, we need to get that out there. Um, and if it was not for Louie, I would not be on the path that I am today. So I've got, Louis to thank for helping point me in the right direction as far as the learning material. Always someone to talk to. Uh, if you call Louis, and he's always been very open, and I am very appreciative of Louis and Westside, what Louis Westside stands for. And we have Michael here who has produced a movie about Louis and Westside. Mm -hmm. So I didn't want to let people know that. And so, what, how did you get involved? You kind of grew up with Westside, kind of doing Westside, your dad. Yeah, I, I grew up, my dad, uh, like a lot of people his age, um, you know, kind of maturing through the uh, through the early 80s and, and sort of the, the early wave of when bodybuilding really hit uh, popularity at large scale after, you know, in the wake of like pumping iron. Um, like a lot of people back then, he thought that weight training and bodybuilding, you know, that was kind of the only way to go. Uh, he did not have the genetics for it, um, neither do I really, uh, you know, he didn't have big muscle bellies or, or you know, he wasn't, he, he didn't get really lean or really defined, nothing really showed, but he, he liked getting stronger, he liked being in the gym, um, but like a lot of people at the time, his approach was just very simplistic, um, but he had a, he had a back, uh, problem when he was younger, um, and it's one that likely I actually have a, a congenital back condition. Um, however, for me, it's never been an issue, uh, probably because I started lifting relatively young um, and always did a ton of back work. But for him, it was a lifelong sort of concern and something that doctors had always told him to, you know, shy away from lifting and whatnot. He inherently knew that it, that he should be lifting, he should be getting stronger. Yeah, because that's li not lifting is usually the worst thing you can do. Yeah, yeah, not lifting is just atrophying and degenerating. 
Yeah, and I was talking to Dave Tate, you know, he's not squatting to a box that's at 90 degrees because he's had two hip replacements. Mm -hmm. And so he's trying to squat at a box higher and he's not trying to do step down moves because stepping down is one of the worst things that you can do for your hip. Right. As far as pressure coming back up, but if your foot's stable, Mm -hmm. And he's just trying to increase bone density and muscular strength to keep him, if he were to slip a fall getting out of his car going to the grocery store, you know, he's trying to make sure that he's building bone density and he's building strength. So you can't really crack on him for his box not being low because he's not competing. Right. All he's trying to do is build bone density yeah. and strength. And so that's kind of like, he's had two hip replacements and each hip joint's got so many uh, rotations or whatever, but mm -hmm. If he does not build that strength and that bone density, it's actually worse for the hip joint. You know, and that's oh, kind of yeah. like, like you can't do nothing. I mean, I don't know why these doctors and stuff, and I get on these tangents because I think they don't take the athletic mind. And right, they're, they're trying well, they to go. Don't, they don't take the athletic mind, but it's also they don't take the logical mind. Yeah, there's no logic to that. It's you know, avoidance is not a avoidance is never really a, a solution. If you avoid a problem, the problem grows in the void that you create. Um, so that's, it doesn't matter what the, what the industry or what the, the application is, avoidance is never a good problem solving strategy. Yeah, and that's when, like, when I tore my um, tricep last year, mm -hmm. I, I was trying to talk to the doctor, I said, I'm not really worried about the tendon being attached to the bone. Said, I'm worried about the muscular power for when it fires and pulls that tendon from the bone. I said, mm -hmm. so, I can go a year without benching and still bench 390. Mm -hmm. And so I said, so my fear is, how well is that tendon gonna be attached to the bone? I said, and once that tendon's attached, how long is it gonna take a calcified so I can be able to produce force? I said, when I'm sitting here and my arm's bent, my, my tricep is cramping. So when that muscle's fired, it's got some type of tendon pull. Mm -hmm. And um, he, the doctor didn't really talk to me at first, you know, cause he was like, oh, whatever. Just, just the meat head coming in. Yeah. And so then I met with him probably four days in a row. And mm -hmm. after talking to me, he started understanding. Like, I said, look, I'm going to lift again. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to be back where I was at. You know, it's, I mean, not lifting is not an option for me. Right. And so after surgery, he finally told me how he repaired it. He put average people, he puts one anchor point in. Uh -huh. And so after my elbow was repaired, he put those four anchor points in. Mm -hmm. And he showed me how he did this crisscross uh, stitch pattern in it. And so he started talking to me more about the medical side of the stuff, because that's why they get into orthopedics and stuff for the surgeries. You know, sitting there doing the consultations is not the fun part, doing the work is. Yeah. And so I thought that was kind of cool, you know, and if I wouldn't have never went down that path to talk to him about how I'm gonna lift him in, and mm -hmm. my concern about the muscle firing, he may have just put one anchor point in. Yeah. You know, and, and so that's kind of like, and I was talking to a girl over in Sweden, and she said they do have different areas. For, the schools are different for athletes as they are for common people. Mm -hmm. And so I thought that was pretty cool. If, they, if the doctors we would have athletic doctors uh -huh. versus common doctors, I think some things could be a little different. I'm sorry to get off on that, <laughs> but I <laughs> no, just want to let not not lifting's not the option. Yeah, you, you know, know? It, it's it, you know for for almost every injury, you know, like what helps blood flow? Mm -hmm. How do you get blood flow? Movement. Yeah. Yeah, and, and Ken Kanakton was talking about that, the uh, guy who puts all the Swiss imposing. Uh -huh. When that spine does not have movement, you're gonna get degenerative disc disease. Right. Because movement creates flow. Right. Flow creates healing. Mm -hmm. And so he said, if you don't, and that's where the reverse hypercup, we're, we're, we're kind of getting yeah. kind of getting the circle, well, and it's kind of like, when you're doing a reverse hyper, those vertebral discs, the only way to get nutrition to those discs is by a pumping action, and that's kind of like the reverse hyper game. But if you yes. were to sit here like we're doing, and you not do anything, that disc is just gonna go away. You yeah. can actually bring nutrients and heal that bad boy mm -hmm. by doing the reverse hyper. And, and that and I thought when I was doing that kink and acting course, the muscle testing course, everything starts to make sense. But sometimes when you listen to something for the first time, mm, that's weird. But if you, yeah. if you start to dwell into it, you can understand. Yeah, well, I think um, sort of on, on, on that tangent, um, and this is kind of un completely unrelated at this point to what, <laughs> to what you asked me earlier, but uh, um, though the reverse hyper does factor in, that's, that's sort of the entry point to, 
my exposure and, and my relationship with Westside is through the reverse hyper. Um, but while we're talking about the reverse hyper, lots of people, um, in I guess in part of part of doing a documentary, part of doing doing what I do, is that basically a large part of my skill set and a large part of my profession, so to speak, is um, spotting patterns, and it's applying logic and you know it's applying logic and spotting patterns. So I'm spotting patterns with people's relationships, you know, as in, in the case of West Side versus the World, which is the, the film. Uh, I'm gonna make sure that the, the name gets in there. West Side versus the World, available on iTunes. Amazon. Yeah, May 7th, the release date, right? May 7th. May 7th again, because I know a lot of people do not understand what May 7th means. <laughs> <laughs> no one understands what updates mean, emails mean, comments mean. Um, I thought they taught us how to read in elementary school. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, but uh, you know, the the reverse hyper over the last couple of years that's been something that uh, you know it's it's something that I've used. I've so I've had a reverse hyper in my parents' house since 1994. Mm -hmm. um, my you know mom has used a reverse hyper. My dad's used a reverse hyper. I've used the reverse hyper. My sister who has cerebral palsy, she's used a reverse hyper. Um, we've had car accident victims come over and use the reverse hyper, chiropractors, people of all kinds of different, you know, age and skill set and athletic abilities and, and general fitness levels all come over and use the reverse, the reverse hyper. Do you know who uh, Robin Good is or her? She's a famous, she was a famous Olympic weightlifter. I okay. do not. She was one of the first women for when the U.S. finally had Olympic lifting in the Olympics, 2000. Uh, Robin was one of the women on there. She, I think in 94, she won the world championships, one of the mm -hmm. fewest female athletes in the US to actually win the world championship. Yeah. Um, John Coffey, who does mm -hmm. Olympic training, trained her along with Ben Green and things like that. They actually, coming up through high school, I kind of learned Olympic lifting through them because I used, mm -hmm. We, we had to do it in high school. I wanted to be better at it, but I was asking my coaches by watching TV and noticing how they're doing it on TV. I realized one of my coaches don't have a clue. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so my it ended up being my physics teacher because mm -hmm. I was always involved with lifting ever since I was about sixth grade, 12 years old for me. Um, I, I just wanted to be better and I wanted to be better so that I could play football. And so if we had to do power clean, I was a kid that out power clean, so I wanted to get better at it because I, mm -hmm. I didn't like getting beat at anything I did. Um, so when so somehow my physics teacher found out that I like to lift weights, well, he told me to go to this guy, Ben Green. He trained two Olympians and two national championship teams. Tommy Inglesby was mm -hmm. the world's strongest man guy. He was one of our workout crew partners, uh, Dean and Robin and um, I forgot who else, but John Coffey was involved. Anyway, the, the whole story going back to is they had a reverse hyper, uh -huh. and Robin said she would not have been as successful as she was if it was not for the reverse hyper. She said the reverse hyper pretty much saved my career. Yeah. And so that's even on the Olympic lifting side of things. And that, uh -huh. that's coming from just not your average Olympic lifter or high school. That's coming from your Olympic level Olympic lifter. And right. So, and so whether you're powerlifting, whether you're injured, whether what you're doing, the uh, the thing's got value, you know? Oh yeah, well, and, and I guess so, uh, again, with the idea that a, a primary sort of part of my job is spotting patterns um, and applying logic um, to those patterns. Over the last, <laughs> over the last few years, it's become sort of in vogue for a lot of people to you know, criticize and second guess the reverse hyper. And one of the big things that you always hear when people do that is, well, you know, oh, it's spinal flexion under load. And people people talk about this idea of, you know, doing things under load. Um, I've, when I hear that, I something that's never quite made sense to me is that when are we not under load? Yeah. We exist on Earth, gravity is, Gravity is all around us, you know, constantly, whether you're, you know, 
your body weight is always loaded via gravity onto you. And it doesn't matter what, you know, what plane or, or you know, how you rotate anything, there's always load going down towards the center of the earth. So it's just a matter of how much load. And then how much load is all relative to your strength level. So, you know, the 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 criticisms of the reverse hyper of, you know, um, you shouldn't you shouldn't put your your flex your spine on your load and it's like, well A, that, that load is not loaded really onto the spine. The only thing that's on the spine is the weight of your body on top of the spine. Like yeah. the weight of your back on the spine supported by your you know, rib cage and sternum mm -hmm. doesn't make any real sense. Yeah. Um, but uh, that's one of the big things in doing this whole movie is is the idea that physics remain constant and they're never suspended. And yet, a lot of times we fall into this trap of talking about, especially different exercises and different ideas and methods, as though they only work or they only exist when you're in the weight room. When the reality is they go all outside. You know, I've done in the process, of, you know, now I'm ranting, but in the process of doing this, I did interviews with, uh, with people who are, say, highly critical of box squats. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was, you know, one of the funniest things in the world to me. That I could listen to somebody for 20 minutes sit in front of me and tell me how box squats don't transfer or how box squats are detrimental to, you know, this is a person who is a self-proclaimed free squatter. For 20, 30 minutes, they tell me how box squats don't work. And at the end of our interview, I said, you know, like, are you afraid that talking to me is gonna throw off your squat? And they chuckled and laughed and said no. And they got up off the box that they were sitting on in a squatted position with their ankles, you know, with their, their feet and their ankles out in front of their center of gravity they leg curled up off of that, off of that. In this case, it was literally they were sitting on a plyo box, leg curled and squatted up off of it, walked across their gym, and proceeded to sit down and back into another chair where they spent another presumably three or four hours for the rest of the day answering emails and taking phone calls. And they're saying how doing a box squat is going to throw off all their movement patterns. And I said, like, how do you get to the gym in the morning? Do you not box squat back in your car? Do you not do you not box squat down onto the toilet every you know at least a couple times every day? Like yeah. what are you, you know? But all of that in their mind only applies for these like just few minutes here and there throughout the day. Yeah, it's, I, I get so aggravated with the box squat thing, but I think a lot of people don't even test to see if it's even working for what they want to. And I think they get okay. Well, for me, my athletes. My athletes, we're not training for power fatigue, we're training for sport. Yeah. It's all I care, and as long as that box watch transferred for their running speed to get better. Mm -hmm. And um, this is my most recent box squat story is that I had two kids who came in. Mm -hmm. And this was perfect because they both go to the same high school weight training. Right. Okay, they both come to the gym and they go to the same high school. So I told this one kid, I said, do you want to run faster? He said, I just want to get strong. He, he didn't want to box squat at all. Right. Because they didn't box squat at school. Mm -hmm. Well, the other kid had to get faster. Mm -hmm. You know, because he, he, got, he got tired of running a 7 2 60 yard dash. Mm -hmm. And so I don't test a 60, I test a 40. And so I said, if you get better at the 40, you're going to get better at the 60. It's almost impossible not to get a better mm -hmm. at 60 if you're better at 40 yards. And so um, they both ran a 5 2. Well, at the end of the first month, the other kid still ran a 5 2. The other kid ran a 5 1. Mm -hmm. The other kid said, I'm still not going to box squat. He right. said, he just, he said, I just want to be better at regular squat schools and regular squat school. I said, The whole thing about playing sports is you've got to run fast. Mm -hmm. He said, I just want to squat better. So I just kind of said, Whatever. Let's see how long it takes this kid to break. Yeah. Month, at the end of month uh, two, 5 flat, 5 2. So his friend's now two tenths of a second faster than him. You, if, you, if, if we're buddies, I'm not going to let you beat me in the 40 yard dash like that. Yeah. Mont three, four, nine, five, two. Mm -hmm. And he didn't care. In Mont four, he didn't even test. The other kid ran a four eight. So anyway, one kid went from a uh, five two to a four seven. Mm -hmm. The other kid stayed at a five two. 
Now the trick is, once kids box squat went from 315 to 405, the other kids regular squat went from 315 to 405. So they both increased their squat strength by the same amount. Mm -hmm. One was just doing a different squat. Right. And so, um, although his buddy's still around, a four set, he ran a five two. He didn't care. Jared, can I do a front squat now? Yeah. <laughs> and so it's just kind of, it's, it's, oh, I said, whatever. He's, you know, he just wants to be better at school. If he wants to be better at school, that's fine. But that just gave me even more evidence that, because I've, I've, I've even talked to like other people about box squatting. I did a podcast on why we box squat because it transfers to our running, like these NFL guys. And really? Even my NFL guy that um, I had a guy that was 300 pounds. Uh -huh. He was 6'3", 334 inch vertical. Yeah. But he had herniated disc, so we couldn't box squat him already because he was scared to put a load of spine with a uh -huh. ball on his spine. So I used the uh, west side belt squat. Uh -huh. And that's how I trained him. But we did a belt squat off of a box. So we'd sit down to a box and we'd stand up. Right. And so that's kind of my tangent on after getting off on the box squat thing. Yeah. Cause it, it, it aggravates me because I, th I test these athletes every month. Mm -hmm. Every freaking month, I probably ended up testing 175 to 240 yard dashes per month. I know mm -hmm. uh, what's going to happen when they're running 20. If this 20 is going to be this, I can almost tell you what the numbers are. Right. And so I see it and I see these kids, even sometimes, but all of our boxes are off of 12 inch unless their femur lengths are a little bit longer. So if you're mm -hmm. 6'2 or higher, I mean, raise the box one inch. So you're squatting a whole 13 inch box. You're not squatting off of a 15 or a 17 inch box. You know, sometimes they're, yeah. because I know, like um, I did a, Ben Baggett's a pitcher for Stanford University. Mm -hmm. We increased his box, and he's about 5'11", so we increased his box height one inch, just just to see what happened. And his, he went from running a 4'8", 4'9", 5' flat, so we lowered it back down to the original 12 inch. With the, we always squatted up a 12 inch box with the, with the blue foam pad, so once we lowered it back down, then he started getting better at it. Mm -hmm. And so then we went from 5' flat, 4'9", 4'8", I don't know if we got to four, seven, four, six. Because I only get these athletes for a certain period of time. And yeah. the sport starts, so then it's almost like a seasonal All right, So we can take this kid from a 5'2 to a 4'7 baseball season starts. He ended up running a 6'7, 60. Uh -huh. Now he's on the radar for scouts and stuff. So the whole point about it is I had another kid. He went to a speed training place. So they yeah. thought by, just by running and doing all these hurdles and these freaking cones that really pisses me off. Right. They're doing speed training. Well, you know, they're running in their sport all the time. Yeah. And, and so, 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 so more running is going to get them better. Right. And, well, this and, is... and so then he was, he was going to school. And so his dad heard about, well, what happened is <laughs> there was this other kid that was coming to the gym that these two kids were the same speed. Mm -hmm. But now this other kid's got significantly faster than this kid. And so and he knows his uh, velocity, his, uh, his uh, uh, velocity off the bat was hot. Because uh -huh. uh, bench press is quarter with swing speed. So right. once I increased this kid's bench press from 235 to 315, mm -hmm. he's already at four bombs this year. Last year I caught, I asked how many hit zero. Right. And so with this one kid who was going speed training for a complete year, his dad was, I can't believe I wasted a year doing speed training. And he went from, uh, this kid ran a 5.3 to a 4.7, ended up running a 6.6 and a 6.760. Mm -hmm. Now he's got a college baseball scholarship. Yeah. You know, so it's kind of like, well, I may be more expensive than, mm -hmm. than the speed training place. But if you get the result, yeah, it's, it's worth it. Yeah, because now you're not paying for college. I mean, you'd yeah. rather pay me. Well, you're not, it's, it's, you know, think of it, you're not paying for college. But it's also, think about how priceless for your kid. Think about the confidence that your kid has, that they're a collegiate level athlete. Mm -hmm. Think about all of the experiences that they make out on the field, think about the experience, the you know, just the sheer volume of life experiences that you're giving that kid. Then think about, you know, if they're going on to be become a you know collegiate athlete, there's all sorts of social experiences. There's you know, their life is forever changed. They're you know, they're more likely to be you know employable. They're more likely to be you know charismatic and charming and have. Romantic success, like every element of their life, yeah, gets vaulted up because of that. Because once they, once they see that they're getting faster, then they're starting passing some of their peers. Mm -hmm. Their confidence, like you said, it rises. They yeah. become a completely different person. 
Oh yeah, I had. I mean, when I was in when I was in high school, and to go way way back to, you know, how did I get involved with Westside? Well, we went from having a reverse hyper, to, um, you know, my my dad slowly implementing Westside for himself, to you know we're here this weekend or you're up here because of uh, the Elite FTS seminar. Um, some of uh, some of Dave Tate's first seminars outside of the Ohio Valley. Mm -hmm. Uh, one of his first seminars, his first seminar down south for sure, was actually at my house. Really? In my garage, two car garage. Uh, not an ordinary two car garage, a two car garage that at one point had a belt squat, a west side bench, a, uh, two calf hand glutes, a reverse hyper, and two monoliths. In addition to lat pull downs and, and you know, just endless dumbbells and kettlebells and all these other things. But so we were outfitted like a, a, you know, a mini West Side in my dad's garage, and he convinced Dave through a bit of sleight of hand and trickery. Dave thought he was coming to a real gym, and, and you know, shows up in my dad's uh, driveway and figures out like, oh crap, I need to ask more questions yeah, before and, I agree to things. For those of you who don't know, Dave Tate is the owner and CEO of Elite FTS, um, and you can check them out. They sell. A lot of strength equipment, and they give a lot of weight of free content on their website, you know. So, yeah, which is also sort of you know, it's basically it's Dave sort of, Tate really started helping getting Louis had the knowledge, mm -hmm. but I think Dave Tate started helping Louis get the knowledge out there, right? Right, um, and Dave, Dave was a Dave was a good lifter, yep. In my opinion, Dave was never, and I think you would agree with this, he was never a great lifter. Um, but Dave is an integral part of the story of Westside because he helped introduce Westside to um, the world and, and made Westside accessible and understandable to an entire generation of people. Um, but so anyways. Dave Tate, Dave Tate came to your dad's garage and y'all started? Yeah. So Dave Tate comes to my dad's garage. He, he taught a, a seminar in 2000. Um, and thought, you know, he didn't think anyone was, anyone was gonna show up. It was, you know, we didn't have, there was no air conditioning in the garage. It was August in Tallahassee, Florida. Ooh, you know, so it, it rained every day. It's humid, there's mosquitoes because we lived out in the woods. So you had to come, you know, all day, you were just going back and forth between rolling up the garage door to let a little bit of air in and then rolling it back down because, you know, it's raining sideways, everyone's getting wet. Mosquitoes are just pouring in, and then every you know, then it's 130 degrees, and everyone's you know dying of heat stroke. So you pull it back up, you get drenched by tropical storms or whatever was going on. Um, but so he came in 2000, 2001, and 2004, and um, I believe in maybe 2001 he actually taught me how to box squat as part of the demonstration for the uh, for the seminar. So I grew up. Uh, my, I was very lucky that my dad is a very intellectually curious person um, and a very sort of relentless personality. Um, he's honestly, in a lot of ways, he's like Louis. He has a so similar sort of even cadence and speaking style. Uh, not to say that Louis is a, a father figure to me. He is not. Uh, and he does not appreciate constantly being told that he's a father figure to people. So, uh, but for me, he just reminds me of my dad as a human being, not a father figure. But uh, I was just lucky enough that I, so I was around all this and I, my dad would order all the tapes and I would come home from school and I had a group of kids that all came and trained with me. Oh, there's where, that's where I got off on this tangent. But when I was in high school, as a freshman, um, I played football. And as a freshman, I was six foot two, um, 155 pounds. And in my entire freshman year of football, I played four plays. Two of those plays were because a kid's helmet broke. All four of those plays, one of those plays was simply I ran out onto the field and got out to a position before the kid who was actually supposed to be there. And then amid the confusion, the coaches pulled that kid off the field for one play and let me go on, and I recovered an onside kick. Um, but I played in four, for four plays. They were all in a freshman exhibition game, so it wasn't even with the full JV team, and I was like third string among 
just the freshmen. It absolutely enraged me because I was a very competitive person, but I was, I was relative, you know, I hit some growth spurts. I was tall compared to everyone else. Um, I weighed a little more than the average kid. I wasn't, you know, 6'2", 155. It's not like I had much meat on my bones, but mm -hmm. compared to the 14 and 15 year olds, I was kind of big. Um, but I was incredibly competitive, but very sort of timid and meek. And I was afraid to make mistakes and everything. Well, I got into the weight room and I, I just made like a pact with myself that I was going to get so big and so strong. I was you know, going to train so relentlessly that when I came back as a sophomore, damn it, they were going to have to play me mm -hmm. significant minutes on JV. And that was my goal. And I came back my sophomore year, 6'2", 180, 185. So I put on 30 pounds of muscle. And I went from running a 5'4", to running a 4'8". And I went from, you know, benching 125 pounds or something to benching, you know, 205, 215. And um, I noticed that, or rather my teammates and my coaches noticed that I was a lot more talkative. I was a lot more vocal. I was just a lot more confident out on the field. And sure enough, at the end of our our summer before my sophomore year, they told the JV go out to one field, and they told the varsity go out to another. And I ran out with the JV field, ready to just bust some heads and assert myself as one of the 11 best, you know, 10th graders. And uh, I got out, and we were in the middle of warm-ups for that first practice, and one of the varsity coaches came storming over, and we had our names written on like a piece of tape that was taped to our helmet and he went down the line until he found Fahey and he grabbed me by the face mask and said what the hell are you doing you're on varsity and I had no idea I'd gone through summer and I'd gone through spring and I was so focused on just one by one beating the people ahead of me and trying to win every drill and stuff I didn't notice how much better I'd become but all of a sudden I had a sense of identity I was you know I, I got bumped up not just on varsity, but I, week one I was a starting tight end. I was our leading receiver. Our, our first game, I'd only been a tight end to my knowledge for a week and a half. Yeah. And it, you know, after that first game, I was on the front page of the newspaper and suddenly everyone knew who I was. And I have no idea, absent of that change in the weight room, who I, I, I don't think I would be doing what I'm doing now. Yeah, I think the, I was talking to Lee, uh, Lee Heaney, and he said the weight room changed his life. Mm -hmm. It changed his kid's life. Mm -hmm. He wouldn't be where he's at. Now that he started lifting, <clears throat> we got on a thing talking about lifting at a young age. Yeah. You know, lifting at, I think he started 10, he started his kids when he was both eight. So both yeah. of his kids ended up getting scholarships. No one wants to be weak. No, it's a, it's a very, it's a natural, think about it just as, as animals, and, you know, as an instinctual thing. You want to feel powerful and capable of defending yourself, even if logically and rationally we don't live in a society that's very dangerous. You still just, you know, your DNA, you want to be large enough and capable enough that if something were to happen, you're able to defend yourself. So if you're a kid, especially, you know, kids are... A lot of times nervous and neurotic, they're aware of the fact that they are relatively exposed and at the, you know, whim and, and back in the, of the larger beings that surround them. So if you make a kid stronger, think about how much more confident they're going to be. And then that confidence is just going to bloom and blossom as they get older. But it's, I mean, it's, it goes beyond even a logical or rational thing. It's, it's purely instinctual to existing as a, as a mammal. Yeah, I did a, a podcast with a kid named uh, Joe, and he was, when he came to gym, he was shy. Wouldn't mm -hmm. take off his shirt or do anything else like that, and then um, just kind of always hid back behind the yeah. crowd. You hide when you have nothing to show. And, he, and, he, and as he got stronger, he started talking a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Personality started showing up. And then by the time he was a, a senior in high school, he was actually helping me out at the gym. Yeah. And so then he took that, then he went to play uh, 
for uh, West Point, Army football, as a running back. And his leadership skills got better because he said the strength gave him more confidence. Once he got, had more confidence, then he had something to teach. Exactly. And so then once he started teaching the kids at the gym, then it helped him transition to collegiate football. Mm -hmm. Then after his collegiate football was over, then he became a GA for you. Mm -hmm. And, and said so going from that transition from being a player to coach was all part of growing up in the gym and having more confidence to be where he was at. And then he goes off into ranger school and he starts talking about more or less how that really changed his life, kind of like mm -hmm. what you were talking about. So I thought that was, yeah. you don't realize, and um, I heard Dave Tate talk about it, he didn't realize that something that he said really impacted Buddy Morris. Uh -huh. You know, you just never know who you're going to reach or what you're going to say and, and how that affects them. And so when, once, you, once you saw that, it's just kind of like, man, you know, and so and I, I tell people I always don't do a good job of posting and getting on this thing like that, but boy, I got to be better myself. But it's yeah. it's truly amazing the impact that others feel when you don't even know what you're doing. Yeah, um, I I had a really like profound moment, sort of along that lines. Um, so we're having a screening in Tallahassee coming up. And, uh, at, at FSU, right? At, yeah, Florida State, which is, I'm from Tallahassee originally. I went to Florida State, so it's, it's you know, going back to my alma mater, and they were kind enough to get us a theater. Um, so I, I made it a point to, uh, and I've been back in Tallahassee for a few months, but I've been out on the road for probably 80% of the time that I've you, lived there. You've been, yeah, you've been really busy. Yeah, I've, been, I've logged, uh, I've driven up to Columbus, four times in the last six weeks, and I had one other week where I went to Iowa, uh, a nice 20 hour drive each way. What about the Columbus Film Festival? You was, was it the, I went to, it was the Cleveland Film Cleveland, Festival. Cleveland, okay. Yeah. That's um, a pretty big deal. How was the experience there? That was crazy, um, and that kind of goes along to the same thing that I was about to say. About the, um, when we went to Cleveland, you know, I didn't anticipate doing any film festivals. Because from a content perspective, a powerlifting movie, you know. It shouldn't even really exist, right? <laughs> no, it, it shouldn't really. Well, I mean, it should, I've, but I've made the argument that it should. But uh, it, by most people's you know, rationale, it shouldn't exist. But beyond that, film festivals are kind of known for a certain type of movie selling. Um, and gym movies we'll say, um, and frankly, you know, a gym movie that didn't have a twist or some sort of larger social commentary to it, you know, this was a gym movie about just the story of the men and women who went through the gym, um, and it was seen as, like, overly niche and, and, you know, not accessible to the regular person, and I mean, we, we took it on a road show and we went and did, you know, probably 30 screenings around, you know, the U.S., Canada, Australia. Um, and everywhere we went, people loved it, but everywhere we went, people said, I don't think regular people will get into this, though. I think that it's very limited in terms of its appeal. But then we take it to the Cleveland International Film Festival, and we not only got in, but they uh, selected us as one of the premier films within the festival they put us in um, I mean we were in an awards category where I, you know they informed me that we were up for these awards and I, I looked at who the other films were and they were you know directed by and starring Emilio Estevez and Helen Hunt and you know they were there were movies that were Netflix originals and um, big name people yeah big name people big I mean we were by far the lowest budget thing. And, you know, not only that, but, you know, most of this movie was shot by me. It was all written by me. It was all edited by me. It was all produced by me. Um, we had a, uh, you know, we had a great sound mixer and we had uh, a phenomenal young uh, composer who came on and, and really, you know, kicked it up a notch with, an awesome score. Um, 
but we did not, you know, this movie was not made in anything, you know, anything that remotely even looked like an optimal manner. Mm -hmm. It was not, it was the exact way that film school would tell you not to do it. Um, and so we went in, I didn't have an agent. I went to the film festival, we didn't, we didn't, you know, it was me and my girlfriend who was an associate producer on the movie. Um, and it's the first movie that she's ever worked on, you know, so it was just really like she got her experience because simply there, down the stretch especially, there was just too much work for me to do in the time that it needed to take. So she was learning on the fly and doing what I could, you know, in a compressed manner explain to her to do. And we're going into this film festival feeling completely unprepared. We entered the festival late. Our distributor said, you know, why don't you do this? Like, we think it'll be fun for you. Um, plus Cleveland is near Columbus. So, you know, it, it was almost like a, you know, it was, we really like kind of took a flyer on the whole thing and thought that we would go there and just sort of be just another movie and fade into the background. And we got there and everyone knew what our movie was. And the first thing they noticed was, you know, we had 20,000 plus Instagram followers and, you know, over 13,000 Facebook followers and our trailer had over half a million views and all this, you know, stuff that I knew, like when we go to the Arnold, that a big chunk of people at the Arnold know who we are. Yeah. I know when I'm at a powerlifting meet that a lot of people know who I am. But I was going to a place where, you know, I was surrounded by media people and film people who are generally speaking, small sort of, you know, people without athletic backgrounds. Mm -hmm. And I'm this hulking dude who can't wear the hipster clothing that everyone else wears. And you know, I'm wearing a hoodie and cargo pants and, uh, it, you know, and free gym t-shirts. Even the hoodie that I'm wearing now was, you know, somebody gave me it's from, uh, have it here, and they're, they're a fitness apparel company, and they gave me a shirt, a sweatshirt, and it got cold outside, so I'm wearing a shirt, I'm wearing clothes that people gave me, oh, and I'm going to a film festival where, you know, some people are pulling up in limos and stuff, but they singled us out as one of these six sort of premiere films, and they took us to this extravagant dinner, and they introduced us to people who were worth just like tens of millions of dollars, and, um, you know, like serving U.S. ambassadors and uh, all these sort of high-ranking dignitaries and important people, and all those people knew who they knew about our movie, and they all they were asking me all these questions. These people had, you know, some of them had seen it, some of them they had all at least read up on it, and I was just walking in like I had no idea that any of these people would care. I had no idea that any of these people would know who I was. You know, so like, and I had been told just over and over again, you know, this movie probably won't relate to, you know, the general population. And then all of a sudden I find myself in like this multi-million dollar mansion talking to like a U.S. ambassador who's like 80, you know, an 80 year old woman and she's telling me how, you know, she finds something about Louis to be fascinating and he reminds her of some, you know, character in literature and, and I'm just like, what's going, like, this is not what I pictured from this film. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it just, it goes to speak to like what you're saying, you know, that you don't, you know, Dave Tate didn't know when he was impacting people, that he was impacting people. Mm -hmm. Louis Simmons didn't know when he was, you know, all the people in my movie, they, they did not know that they were living a story that would one day become a movie. Uh, and I just, it, to the point that none of us know that what we're doing, you know, there's someone who right now, they, you know, something that you say might. Yeah, impact someone or same yeah. thing, thing, vice versa. I mean, it's just kind of, you never know who's watching, so you might as well take care of those others. Because um, I, I think that's the biggest thing, like when they take, live, learn, and pass on, you know, the knowledge that you got, the knowledge I get. I, I'm trying to help others, and sometimes I don't know what I'm doing to help others. Right. But by being silent, we're not making a movie. Yeah, we're definitely doing nothing. <laughs> right, right. Like by fading in the background, you're not doing anything. Um, and again, that's that same. Just as I said earlier, you know, like uh, avoidance is never the answer. You know, avoiding uh, uh, a 
avoidance or absence, you know, the avoiding that whatever your calling is or avoiding whatever your passion is or avoiding, you know, avoiding the spotlight um, because you feel afraid or unworthy in some manner, you know, Cowering when you're when you're on the field, afraid that you're going to make a mistake, avoiding the scenario in which you might make a mistake is never solving anything. You know, you have to attack that scenario and with you know experimentation. And if something fails you, then you try something a little different. You just keep trying something a little different until you get the you know the right combination of elements that works. Whether that's training or whether that's you know, something professionally or again, you know, in a relationship or talking to your kid or something like you just it, you know, not trying for feel of, for fear of failure only ensures failure. Yeah. And so um the uh, Cleveland family you guys wanna talk about the um, FSU? Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. Um, we, we, I guess that's what happens when you don't have a script. We just kind of go from we, we, <laughs> yeah. That's um, all right. Man, I like I like the raw stuff. Yeah. Um, well, what I was what I was going to say with uh, with FSU, sort of to that same point, I'm going around FSU promoting the screening that we're having, and I'm I'm just going to other. I was going around, and you know, I'm in Tallahassee, which was very familiar to me. It's my hometown, but at the same time. For most of the last decade, I lived in Los Angeles. I lived in Pasadena. Um, I lived in Orlando for a short time. You know, so I'm moving back to my hometown. I know all the streets, but you know, the the paint on the buildings is all new, and the signs are new, and you know, the the same guy doesn't own the same store, and you know, like everything's a little different. So I'm going back, and I when I left, there weren't any powerlifting gyms. You know, we trained, the only powerlifting gym in town was like my garage. And I go and I start, you know, going to some of these new gyms that have popped up around campus and around Florida State. And, um, a lot of them have a strongman focus or a powerlifting focus. Yeah, a lot of, a lot of them are the campus, the old campus gym to train because I know mm-hmm. I've got a girl that goes to Auburn she does powerlifting they got a powerlifting team at Auburn now yeah Jerry Tech's got a powerlifting team yeah young kids are they're going in there they're powerlifting now and, and I think even some uh, Texas universities some universities like Texas uh, Texas A&M and mm-hmm. I think they even offer ten thousand dollars a semester for powerlifting Jeez. yeah and so I, it, it's growing yeah um but so as it's growing you know <coughs> I'd go around all these gyms, and I just had some flyers, and they were, you know, the our little cover artwork, and then they had some information about the screening. And I go to the first gym, and I, you know, go in, and hey, uh, you know, I'm I'm this director. I'm from Tallahassee. We're having a free screening. Um, it's about powerlifting. You know, have you ever heard of Westside Barbell? And they kind of go, um, I think I have. And I'm a little sad inside. Yeah, that, that's kind of sad because you you. you you, you're powerlifter. You heard of you heard of Louie, You heard of Westside, and, and some people still say no. And I'm saying, yeah. I'm saying, how are you in this sport? <laughs> yeah. Well, in this case, it was it was a very young girl. She was probably around you know 21, 22, and uh, my guess is had not been lifting a, a terribly long time. And gotten a job at a gym. And, you know, she's on the beginning of her journey. So I was like, okay. Uh, you know, she clearly heard the words before. But wasn't real sure of what it meant. Mm-hmm. But I handed her the flyer and said, you know. Well, it's this. It's this. You know, it's a feature-length movie. It's a real movie. It's a. It's a. You know, it's a real documentary. We've won awards and stuff. You know, we have our narrator is Ron Perlman. You know, we have. Yeah. You know, so there's some celebrity behind it. She says, "Well, who's that?" Sons of Anarchy. And she says, well, I never watched that show. I'm like, well, you know that it was a popular show, though, right? You know, and it's like that's how young she is. Is yeah. like a show that went off the air like three years ago. She's like, you know, I don't know, but. uh she goes, okay, well, I mean, it sounds interesting. You know, I'm sure the staff will come check it out. I go to the next uh, the next gym and, you know, same thing. Like, hey, have you heard of my side? And, uh, kind of. You know, like, I'm getting all these kind of wishy-washy answers. And I go to, like, the third or fourth gym, and I walk in, and uh, there's a pretty young guy behind the desk, and um, it's a gym that I had gone into once a few years earlier. 
and uh, I walk in and go, hey, uh, you all haven't heard of West Side uh, versus the World, have you? And the guy perks up and goes, you're that guy. <laughs> and I go, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm the director. I, I'm, I'm the director and producer. And he goes, I know, dude, I follow you. I was, what are you doing in Tallahassee? And I said, well, I live here. Oh my God! How do you? How did I not know this? And, and you know, like, and I go, well, we're having a screening. And he's, oh, that's awesome! I've been waiting to see. And so he's super excited, and, and he calls over, you know, two or three other guys, and you know, all of a sudden, it took like four gyms, but all of a sudden, now I'm in a place where, like, these four or five strangers who again are like in their early twenties and probably you know nearly a decade younger than me, and you know, so they're not people that we ever cross paths with. And uh, they asked me to like sign their flyer. And I was like, okay, that's weird, whatever, you know, like, okay, I'll sign the flyer. And then I'm, I'm then I left from there and I actually went to uh, Jeremy Hornstra's gym. Uh, phenomenal bench room, 675 raw, uh, either 242 or 275. Uh, and I had no idea that he lived in Tallahassee. And so I walk in and, you know, hey, have you heard of Westside Firebell? And he goes, oh yeah, I've heard of him. <laughs> and he says, you know, I go, oh, so, you know, have you heard of the movie? And he's like, ah, I think I heard something about it. And, and, and he says, you know, but uh, I, I've heard of Louie, and, you know, I heard he, someone sent me a podcast he did or something where he mentioned me, and I said, wait, what's your name? He's Jerry Hornster. And I go, oh, my God, wait, why are you here? And he's, well, I, you know, I went to school here. Why are you here? You made a movie. And I go, well, I went to school here. And, and, you know, this weird experience, but then... I'm driving home and I think back to again that gym where like the kid knew who I was mm -hmm. and he asked for you know when I gave him the flyer he asked for a second one and had me sign the first and I don't sign a lot of autographs you know I've signed a few in my day but not many um, and it's it's just like novel and funny to me when people ask for it but I'm I'm driving home and I realize like I realize when that kid had me sign Liar. what he was doing was he wanted some sort of tangible memento that he could, you know, commemorate meeting me. Mm -hmm. And I thought about it for a second. I was like, that's so crazy. I said, like, th this was a complete stranger, yet meeting me was something that, and again, this is in no way to say that I am something, you know, like, of any note, but it was just the idea, like, to have your experience as a person validated, yeah. that you meet a complete stranger and they go, like, oh, I need to remember this moment, you know, like... Yeah, just like we were talking, you never know when you're going to... I mean, the whole thing is you just never know. Yeah. Um, and so that was... That was just profoundly strange and crazy, and I thought, like, that was a little tiny moment where I was, like, you know, like, maybe I'm, maybe, like, maybe I've done something here, <laughs> like... You know, like someone, someone who I've never met, someone who I did not know existed, mm -hmm. thought that my, you know, thought that crossing paths with me was yeah. that notable that they wanted a piece of paper with my signature on it so that they could show some. That, that means that they have someone else in their life who they thought, you know, yeah. would also care that they had a piece of picture or a piece of paper with my scribbled signature on it. That's pretty cool. So. It's super weird, but it, 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 like you think about it, you're like, that, that feels kind of awesome. Yeah. And so, all right, we're going to do something. We're going to actually break this up into two parts. So okay. we're going to, we're going to end this uh, with uh, part one. Um, so where, where can they follow you at? Uh, you can follow me on Instagram. Uh, that's the big place. Instagram and Facebook. I have the same username on both and Twitter, actually. And occasionally I, I tweet something out that gets a lot of traction with uh, sports coaches for some reason. Yeah, and I usually don't get on Twitter unless my little, I get too many red dots on the, yeah. <laughs> the count number. So I got to get, get that stuff cleared out. Yeah, um, but occasionally I, I say something on there. But um, you can follow me on any of those platforms at Westside Film. Just that's it at Westside Film, okay. and you can look for Westside vs. the World. It'll be out on Amazon, iTunes, Google Play, uh, everything basically except for Amazon Prime, Hulu, and Netflix on May seventh. 
if it sells really well, then that's how it gets to those other big platforms that everyone yeah, wants to watch. Yeah, we've got it. to get that out there. So yeah. Well, um, we're gonna end part one. So, uh, Mike, thanks. It's it's been a blast. Thanks for having so, me. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. All right. We